Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 19th Annual Cardinal O'Connor Conference on Life. My name is Michael Kahn. I've had the immense pleasure of working with Julia Greenwood, my lovely co-director, to bring the conference to life this year. We hope today that you'll connect with us on social media, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, at OCC on Life, and please use the hashtag OCC on Life when tweeting today. Also, visit our website for more detailed information about our wonderful speakers. And of course, use our Snapchat geo filters. You can find all this information about these handles and hashtags on the second page of your program. John Cardinal O'Connor, an alumnus of Georgetown, was a renowned and courageous advocate for a culture of life during his tenure as Archbishop of New York. In January 2000, Georgetown students first hosted a national pro-life conference for many college students and pro-life activists who traveled to our nation's capital for the March for Life. The conference was later named in Cardinal O'Connor's honor. We are thrilled to continue that tradition today for the 19th time. Cardinal O'Connor famously said, it is my very sincere prayer that if I live for a week, if I live for 20 years, my last breath will be in support of the sacredness of every human life. We as a conference strive to match his unwavering commitment to human life and dignity. Over the past year of conference planning, we could not help but notice the changing landscape of the pro-life movement. According to all the survey data, the future of the pro-life movement, much like the future of our nation, is younger, less religious, and more diverse than previous generations motivated by life issues. Many in our movement today invoke the language of human rights and science, for instance, rather than religion to advance the pro-life cause. This development inspired us and our conference board to develop this year's theme, Irreligiously Pro-Life, the Future of the Movement in a Secular World. Through this theme, we wanted to gauge whether or not there are valid, non-religious arguments for life, and even if removing God from the equation lessens the moral imperative which so animates the traditional religious segment of the pro-life movement. Our end goal is simple, to defend and promote a consistent ethic of life among believers and non-believers alike. Before we tackle that ambitious goal, we would like to start the morning with an opening prayer. Unfortunately, Father Bosco could not be with us today, but please welcome to the stage Father Matthew Carnes, Professor of, Ge of Government here at Georgetown, to deliver the invocation. Thank you, uh, Michael and uh, Julia, for that introduction and uh, for organizing this spectacular day. And thank you all for coming um, to this space. Uh, Gaston Hall is our more, most storied hall. And I just want to point out a couple features of it. One is that it was built in the late 1880s. And so it has the uh, seals of all of the Jesuit schools that existed in the 1880s. So if you're from a Jesuit school and it was founded before the 1880s, you can probably find the seal somewhere up there. It was all of them around the world. Now, it's a space that tries to teach us, much as we are learners here. And so you'll notice at the very top up here across the um, very top of the wall, it says wisdom, because we hope that everyone who comes to this space is inspired by wisdom. And then much harder to see, and in fact, don't even try to look for it because the bright lights won't let you, but across that back wall, mirroring wisdom is the word virtue, because it's to remind every speaker from this space that what we are about here is about learning and proclaiming virtue. And then at the heart of it all, across here in these circles, we have the motto of the Jesuits, ad maiorum dei gloriam, for the greater glory of God and for the salvation and well-being of humankind, our mission and what we try to do here. And at the center of it all, although slightly hard to see except for all of you who are up above, is the name of Jesus, IHS, which is right up in that triangle, a little bit hidden by this screen today, but that's no, where the name of Jesus because Jesus is at the center of what we do here, the Society of Jesus, Georgetown's mission, and especially what we strive to do in our uh, championing of the cause of life. So let us begin in prayer today. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wondrous gift of life. It is a gift you share generously, and it shines through in the lives of our brothers and sisters, at every stage and every precious moment of life. Lord, teach us to treasure one another and every member of our human family. Help us to see the dignity of the unborn and the aged, the infirmed and the injured, the prisoner and the free, the young and the old. 
Help us to recognize you in every migrant who crosses a border, every refugee forced from their home, every person facing addiction or experiencing homelessness, in the poor and those who live beyond the walls our society constructs. So that in, your, in our church, in our community, all might know that they are beloved and have a home. And today, Lord, we ask your blessing on our gathering. We come together in a university, a place of discourse and dialogue, a place of inquiry and research and questioning in the service of your truth and your justice that we know is only fulfilled in your wisdom. We ask you to make us humble learners, poised to listen for the best in the words and ideas of those who speak, that in the midst of an often fractured society, which too often spews hate with the harshest of words, we might model the kind of respectful, loving conversation that welcomes and that convinces. Enliven our gathering and our advocacy and help us to be people of action, pouring ourselves out in ministry in hospitals and in clinics and all those places where life is in the balance, that we might accompany with love and compassion our brothers and sisters facing the most harrowing choices about life. May our embrace encourage and inspire them to choose life. And may we contribute to public policy that provides the assistance to sustain those choices. Gracious God, you are the author of life and you make us agents of life. Bless all who participate today in this gathering, all who have traveled from near and far to give witness to life. May this day make our efforts more, ever more intelligent ever more informed, and ever more effective. We make all these prayers with deep gratitude and hope through your Son whose passion transformed death into life and who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Father Collins. Uh, before we begin, we would like to remind all of you of our speech and expression policy. Georgetown University is committed to standards promoting speech and expression that foster the exchange of ideas and opinions. While it is recognized that not everyone may share the same views as a speaker, it is expected that everyone in, the att in attendance at this event respects the right of the speaker and our conference board to share their perspectives and ideas by not causing a disruption to this event's activities. With that said, we are truly honored to have with us Lila Rose as our keynote speaker this year. Lila Rose is a speaker, writer, and human rights activist. Lila founded and serves as president of Live Action, a media and news nonprofit dedicated to ending abortion and inspiring a culture that respects all human life. Live Action's groundbreaking news coverage and compelling videos reach several million people weekly across Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Lila's media appearances include Fox News' Hannity, Tucker Carlson Tonight, The Story with Martha McCallum, as well as CNN, HLN, and many other national television and radio programs. Lila's investigative reporting on the abortion industry has been featured in most major news outlets, including the Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, CBS, and ABC's Nightline. Lila has written for The Hill, Politico, USA Today, First Things, among other publications. Lila also speaks internationally on family and cultural issues and has addressed members of the European Parliament and spoken at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Lila has been named among Red Alert's 30 Under 30, National Journal's 25 Most Influential Washington Women Under 35, and Christianity's Today, Today's 33 Under 33. A native of the San Francisco Bay Area, Lila also serves on the advisory board of Obria Health Group and on the board of the Queen of, Queen of Angels California Foundation. Again, we are honored to have with us today. Please welcome to Georgetown University and to Gaston Hall, Lila Rose. Thank you so much, Michael, for that warm introduction and for Julia backstage and Madeline and all the amazing folks who helped put, down, put together this wonderful event at this wonderful institution. I'm very honored to get to address you and also honored that there are folks from a lot of other amazing schools as well. I think there's some Notre Dame people out there. Maybe a few. Benedictines? Any Benedictines? Okay, a lot of Benedictines. Naval Academy? 
Anybody? Okay, we got a couple. Wonderful. It's really, really an honor and, and a delight because we are here, gathered together, as people who are commemorating a very solemn anniversary. We're commemorating 45 years of Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court decision that decided that somehow abortion was a right and that killing a, a child, a human life, was a constitutional right and upheld the act of abortion as women's health care. And we're here because we're mourning the loss of 60 million of our pre-born brothers and sisters, 60 million children who have been killed by abortion. We're here bound together by a common cause. And whether here we are Catholics or we are Protestants or we are Republicans, whether we are Democrats, whether we're independents, whether we don't hold by a particular religious label or a particular political label, whether we're students or professors, whether we're young and old, we're all here because we share a common concern for the inviolable right to life that right to life which should not be violated, a common concern to hold that right firm for all people, regardless of their age, regardless of their size, regardless of their level of dependency. John Paul II was musing about the words of Abraham Lincoln when Abraham Lincoln mused about wondering whether or not the great republic, our country, our great democratic republic would be able to hold when so many different opinions arose, so many different the, the culture seemed to go so many different ways. And John Paul II says, democracy cannot be sustained without a shared commitment to certain moral truths about the human person and human community. The basic question before a democ democratic society is, how ought we to live together? In seeking an answer to this question, can society exclude moral truth and moral reasoning? This is why we have division today, why we have abortion. There's a radical, there are radical different views of what it means to be hum human in our country today. And those radical different views are competing. But we're here today because we share the radical view or the foundational view for our entire constitution from our Declaration of Independence that there is certain fundamental human rights. And the first of which is the right to life. And we are, we are devoted to defending that first human right and to defending those intimate human bonds that tie us together. The bonds between mothers and fathers, the bonds between children and their parents, the bonds between each other, those bonds that are sacred that we want to defend. I recently met with a former abortionist, Dr. Anthony Levitino. Have any of you heard of him? Dr. Anthony Levitino is now a pro-life activist, but he spent years committing abortions, and he actually committed over 1,200. And I was with him to interview him and to talk and hear more of his story. And Dr. Levitino shared with me his time of conversion, what made him change his mind. He had been struggling with infertility with his wife while he was practicing as a doctor, and he wanted so badly to have his own child, he and his wife. Unable to conceive, they decided to adopt, and they welcomed a beautiful four-year-old little girl named Heather into their home. When Heather was, uh, one, one night they had friends over for coffee, and it was, a, it was after dinner, and Heather and the, the friends of their friends' children were playing outside in the front yard, and the Levitinos and their friends are enjoying their coffee, and the kids are playing outside, and all of, the, all of a sudden they hear the screeching of tires, and they hear screams. Of course, the adults run outside in a, in a panic and see that Heather had wandered into the road and been hit by a car. Dr. Levitino's a doctor. His wife is actually a nurse. They gather up their daughter in their arms. They call 911. They're accompanying her in the ambulance, but their daughter dies in their arms. Dr. Levitino was sharing with me then that after this horrific experience, after he buries his daughter, he realizes he has to get on with his life. He has to go back to work. He has to continue on with his life. And so he went back to commit his first abortion since the death of his daughter. And this is what he told me. He said, I wasn't thinking anything special. This was a routine for me. I had other things on my mind. I started the abortion. I put in what's called a sofa clamp, and I ripped out an arm or a leg about this big, and I just stared at it in the clamp. I got sick. This is an early second trimester abortion. I literally got sick. But when you start an abortion, you can't stop. When you do a D and E abortion, you have to keep inventory. You have to make sure that you get two arms and two legs and all the pieces, because if you don't, 
Your patient will come back infected, bleeding, or dead. I finished that abortion. I soldiered on, and I got it done. But I looked. For the first time in my career, I really looked at that pile of baby parts sitting on the table, and I didn't see all of those things that had sustained me all of those years. I didn't see what a wonderful doctor I was for helping her with her problem. I didn't see what a wonderful right to choose. What a wonderful, I didn't see her wonderful right to choose. And I didn't see the $800 in cash that I had just made in 15 minutes. All I could see was someone's son or daughter. I share these words with you because Dr. Levitino believed those lies for so long that this was health care, that this was the right to choose, that this was a successful and noble profession. But suddenly he had his conversion moment. He had an encounter with the humanity of the child. He saw someone's son or daughter, and suddenly those lies no longer held in his mind. George Orwell has said, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable. The abortion lobby in our country today and from the beginning have been masters of seizing the language and using it to mask the violence and the pain and regret that so many men and women experience. But we can expose those lies. We can tell the truth. And with the truth, the lie loses its power. These are some of the lies about what abortion is. There is, of course, the lie, as you have heard, and is constantly touted in national networks, among politicians, amongst the Hollywood elite, amongst powerful forces throughout our country, the lie that abortion is somehow health care, and that women are somehow better for it. And in the name of this lie, abortion facilities have been set up across our country, near our churches, near our schools, near our homes, in our communities. In fact, less than 10 miles from here, in a medical office complex next to, nearby to a dermatologist's office, Cesare Santangelo, an abortionist, commits his work, committing abortions actually through all nine months. Live Action has investigated this abortionist in DC it, to see how he responds to children who might be born alive after an abortion procedure. And he assured our investigator, who was nearly six months pregnant, that if her baby was born alive, because that baby was viable, he would make sure that that baby did not survive. He would allow that baby to die or do something to kill that child. Meanwhile, in Maryland, also not too far from here, Carhartt, Leroy Carhartt, commits his work. And as you know, as you may have heard of Leroy Carhart, a very infamous abortionist who flies in from Nebraska, he also commits abortions up through all nine months. One of our investigators also visited Carhart while he was in Nebraska. She was 25 weeks pregnant. She was a brave first time mom. She's on the live action team. And she was sitting in an, in an undercover setting, sitting with Dr. Carhart, discussing what would happen if her baby survived the abortion attempt. Dr. Carhart said to her, and assured her that he would destroy her child, that the child would not survive, and if it did, that he would make sure that there would be no repercussions for the mom or for him. He said to her, quote, I'd have better luck standing in front of a train going 100 miles an hour and surviving than this baby will. Powerful that he himself says the word baby in this private setting, in this clinical setting. He himself admits that this is a baby. Some abortionists don't realize it, they don't see it. Many in the abortion industry may not see it yet. They may not have that had their moment, but many do, some do, and Dr. Carhart does. Powerful forces in our country today are built, have built businesses on abortion. Of course, Planned Parenthood is the biggest abortion chain in this country, a $1.2 billion organization, building a business model on the shared, the shared aspects of abortion and contraception. And they don't want the facts to be known. And they don't want to acknowledge the fact that science, reason, religion all tell us the same thing about life and when life begins. Dozens of embryology textbooks, of medical textbooks, reveal uh, to us the embryology, reveal to us that powerful moment when a single-celled embryo forms. An unique, unreplaceable, irrepeatable, single-cell embryo, a human life has begun. And all that that life needs to grow, to become like us, to become an adult one day, is the time and nourishment, the protection that that life deserves. Basic moral reasoning tells us this. It's one of the reasons we're here, whether we're religious or not, whether we are one part of politi a political party or not. Basic moral reason and science reveals this. 
But Roe, Roe v. Wade was built on this lie that somehow abortion would empower women, that abortion was a matter of health care, and that abortion was even a woman's constitutional right. And meanwhile, Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry have built up this, this corporation to thrive on that lie in our country. There's also the lie, of course, that abortion is somehow empowering to women, that women need abortion to be to be advanced in our society, in our country. This is a popular a line of abortion advocates that this is so entrenched in a woman's rights and dignity, in her identity, that she has to have this complete bodily autonomy even over a life growing within her. And yet when I have talked with abortion advocates, when I've actually talked with those that defend it, even folks that have worked in the abortion industry or continue to do that, lobbyists, and I ask them this question, if you could imagine a world without abortion, if that world were possible, would you want a world without abortion? Would you want a world in which no woman would ever have to have an abortion? And the vast majority, after engaging a little bit, admit, well, yes, but women need it. They have to have it. And that's the crux of their, of their reality, that abortion is not a position of empowerment, but abortion is a position of need, sometimes even desperation, sometimes even coercion. Recently, uh, Planned Parenthood tweeted, actually just last month, and Planned Parenthood blocked me on Twitter as well as live action, so I see these tweets through other ways. <laughs> Twitter actually has blocked the entire live action account from advertising, that's a whole other story, um, and Planned Parenthood freely advertises, so there's a, there's a war going on even for speech on Twitter and some social platforms. But Twitter, uh, Planned Parenthood actually tweeted this tweet on Twitter. He, she, they said, and then they quoted to an article describing this further, the, the quote from the story of a girl who was sharing her abortion story. And she said, I was in an emotionally abusive relationship in college. I got pregnant, and my boyfriend told me it was my problem, and he didn't even want to hear about it. I knew abortion was my best and only option. What is this woman saying? This woman is saying, I was in an abusively, um, an emotionally abusive relationship, and I knew that abortion was my best and only option. This woman is describing her lack of choice. She fits the 64% of women who report, self-share, that they felt pressured to abort. Women don't walk into an abortion facility in a position of power. They walk into an abortion facility because they feel they have to be there, whether it's because of a coercive or even abusive relationship, whether it's because of their education or their job that they're concerned about, or family pressures or social pressures. They are there because they feel powerless. Otherwise, they would not be there. And when they submit their bodies and the body of that child to an abortionist, it's the ultimate position of disempowerment. And yet it's being upheld by so-called healthcare institutions and women's health advocates as empowering. There's actually an incredible study that came out recently that not many have seen yet, a white paper from Loyola University's Beasley Institute for Health Law and Policy, and they actually did a survey of sexually trafficked victims. So we're talking the most extreme form, one of the most extreme forms of abuse in this country, the perpetual enslavement of women and children, selling them for sex, a huge problem in our nation. And they were studying the stories of victims, of survivors of sexual trafficking. And what the Beasley Institute discovered was that nearly 30% of the women that they surveyed had been to a Planned Parenthood. In fact, they went to Planned Parenthood more than any other healthcare group. The only place they went to more frequently than a Planned Parenthood was the emergency room. And they would go to Planned Parenthood because they were experiencing pressure to either have an abortion or they'd go there for contraception and then they obviously go right back into the arms of their pimp and their abusers. And the Beasley Institute, of course, is trying to be apolitical and just make a recommendation and said, well, these groups like Planned Parenthood really need to step it up and put in place mechanisms to actually identify and report, as is the law in most states, suspicion of abuse, potential abuse cases. And yet when we've investigated, and we've investigated Planned Parenthood for the trafficking, for the aiding and abetting of trafficking, as well as the cover-up of abuse, Live Action has actually sent in activists posing as abusers, posing as those that are trafficking underage girls, and admitting that, self-identifying with that to Planned Parenthood workers. 
Planned Parenthood, including their managers in some of the facilities we visited, urged them that they had a don't ask, don't tell policy, that they would give them special benefits and help and work with them so that their underage girls could come in for secret abortions and contraception. After Live Action released these videos in 2011, Planned Parenthood responded to the, onlash, uh, the, the, the onslaught of media attention and the, the cry to stop the forced federal taxpayer funding of Planned Parenthood by saying that they would retrain 11,000 of their employees. They wanted to continue, of course, to present themselves as, we care about women's health, we care about women. In the months when they claimed that that retraining happened, Live Action would later find out they, they brought together their staffers across the organization. And later on, we'd learn from the testimony of one former Planned Parenthood manager, Ramona Trevino, who left Planned Parenthood, became pro-life, and then shared her story with us. And she said, during that retraining, after those videos came out, we were taken into a conference room. They turned on the projector. They, they started playing us videos. This was our retraining on how to identify sexual abuse and trafficking. And they started to play live action videos. And they started to started to show us how we could potentially identify if we were being filmed. And Ramona in that meeting raised her hand and said, excuse me, when are we going to learn how to identify traffickers? When are we going to learn how to identify abuse cover-up? And the coordinator there laughed and said, Ramona, we're not here for any of that. We're here to make sure that we don't get caught on tape. That was one of the last straws for Ramona that helped push her to leave Planned Parenthood and leave the abortion industry and ultimately join the pro-life movement and rediscover her Catholic faith. We know that abortion not only kills a child, but it wounds a woman. It disempowers a woman. It harms the, the father that, that abandoned that child, ultimately. It harms all of society. There's also the physical health risks of abortion that are often not even discussed, not even mentioned. And there's an, a tremendous push to hide these facts from the public, from women. Canadian filmmaker Poonam Kumar Gill, how many have heard of her documentary, Hush? This should have been something that received a much more attention than it did, but it was an incredible piece of work because she actually documented how despite the words from the National Cancer Institute and many other healthcare institutions in this country that claim that there is no link between abortion and breast cancer. She showed that since 1957, the first study finding the link, 50 more studies have followed suit to show that breast cancer, the risk for breast cancer is increased by 30% after one abortion. And it skyrockets in women who have multiple abortions or delay their first pregnancy past 35. This research was, has been buried because in 2003, in a conference held by the NCI, by the National Cancer Institute, one researcher who was an abortion activist said in a 20-minute session, I don't believe these studies, and there have been many since, and this is a study that I want to prove that there's absolutely no link whatsoever, and since then it's been taken as Bible by these different institutes of science and medicine, and yet the research continues to show worldwide the reality that the risk for cancer for women is elevated 30% and more after abortion, and yet major medical establishment wants to hide this, wants to silence this. Planned Parenthood is also, as you know, and many of you have seen, has a business model where they're not only pushing abortion, but they're pushing hormonal contraception as a solution to women's health. Fertility is medicated as a disease. It's seen as something that needs to be treated, something, the sign that our bodies are working as women is seen as something that needs to be treated, suppressed. It needs to be brought out of balance or in order to kill our fertility. In fact, Planned Parenthood CEO, you might have seen this on MSNBC, recently mocked those that are wanting to use natural methods to understand and regulate their fertility and mocked those that would use fertility awareness. She said that it was the rhythm method, it would take us back in time, and that anybody learning fertility awareness was just going to be pregnant, and that they needed to be on synthetic hormones. Planned Parenthood, of course, partners with major pharmaceutical companies, with Big Pharma, that's part of their business model. Ironic that the leader of the group that is pointed to by many and claims to be the leader for women's reproductive health doesn't understand the incredible science and tools that have been given to us in the last 10, 20, 30 years to put us in charge of our fertility, to understand our bodies, to work with our bodies naturally. Instead, she could only mock what she thought was an outdated practice, which is really something that is popularized on both sides of the political spectrum, on even both sides of the abortion spectrum, as what is best and most healthy for women. 
You might have seen there's a very interesting op doc I recommend by the New York Times. They had their op-ed doc, mini documentary series online. And it was a video of a woman describing her experience with hormonal contraception. Not any political point of view, nothing about abortion, but she's describing how at age 11 she was put on the pill. This might be the experience of some women in this room, that s doctors and Planned Parenthood ultimately as a, as a political agenda recommend just use this pill, use this, use this device. And she describes how for 10 years from age 11 to 21, she never knew what it was like to not be on the pill. She never knew what her life would be like. She went through her whole adolescence and her teenage years on the pill. And when she went off it at age 21, it was as if she had been depressed and she had never known it. And she describes her experience experimenting with other drugs, with an IUD, with an implant, and how all of these put her out of whack and hurt her sense of well-being, her sense of health, her emotional health, and she ultimately, at the end of the video, is rejected all of them. She can't stand by them. What was missing from the video, of course, was a deeper understanding of NAPRO technologies, of the technologies to treat maybe PMS or other symptoms or problems, but the bottom line is it was an analysis from a, a just a straight-up point of view that it's not working. This system of using synthetic hormones to regulate women's bodies are not working. It is a burden that we are carrying. In fact, a lot of these contraceptives, recent studies have been revealing, also can cause cancer, also can lead to other serious health risks for women, which are also unreported. We have to address the root problem here. Contraception, synthetic hormones, are more than just a bad health decision, although they have been a bad health decision and, and a bad deal for so many women. But there's a deeper problem here. It's deeper than even the abortion problem, this human rights issue that we're banding around. It's a sex problem, a problem about how we view ourselves and how we view sex. Today we have this one-dimensional view. It's the fruit of the sexual revolution. Our culture has a one-dimensional view of sex, the sexual revolution divorced sex from procreation and even from relationship and unity and intimacy. So no unity is required. That means emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. Instead, sex is supposed to be about, according to the sexual revolution, according to many people today, sex is just supposed to be about what feels good, the physical pleasure. And there should be no consequences or barriers to sex. Uprooted from any purpose besides its power for shared pleasure, we are left with this momentary physical experience. We empty sex and we make it meaningless. We've also removed the procreative from sex. And new life is then seen as a threat and not a gift. Now pregnancy, just like fertility, becomes a problem that needs to be fixed, it needs to be eliminated, it needs to be taken care of instead of welcomed and celebrated. And contraception becomes the obvious, necessary thing to divide the pleasure from the potential for life. And then when contraception fails, the mindset is one of frustration and betrayal that many people face. How could this happen? I'm pregnant. Why did this happen? When after all, sex is designed for the creation of new human life. Just that it is designed to bind a man and a woman together to be able to parent and raise those children to form a family. Sex is beautiful, it is pleasurable, it is powerful, but why? Its purpose is to, to unite two people, unlike anything else in this world, is for the possibility of bringing children into the world and binding together a mother and a father, a man and a woman. We've lost balance. We've stripped sex of its meaning, and that has lost our balance. If sex is only about me, if it's only about me and my partner, if it's only about our enjoyment, our experience, our intimacy, and it's not about the potential for a child, not about new human life, then we misunderstand the powerful nature of sex and the nature of ourselves. We breed the mentality that we can have pleasure on our own terms and how we want it. New problems arise that did not exist before. Problems like abortion. Problems like the 60 million lives that have been lost to abortion. Viktor Frankl the Holocaust survivor and psychiatrist, writes in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, and he is an incredible example of what it means to suffer and understand the human condition, our shared human condition. He writes, freedom is in danger of degenerating into mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. That is why I recommend the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast be supplemented by a statue of responsibility on the West Coast. <laughs> I, would, I would be for that. I'm in California. I think that would look really nice. 
Freedom cannot survive without responsibility. Freedom cannot survive without responsibility. Sexual freedom without taking responsibility for each other, to care for each other, to treat each other as we deserve, without opening ourselves up to the responsibility of children that we will do our best to love and care for, sexual freedom without those things is a false promise. And like all false promises, sexual freedom without responsibility brings confusion, pain, isolation, and today, abortion. In the face of our country's confusion, our culture's confusion around sex, around abortion, this great evil of abortion, what's our response? What do we do about this? Viktor Frankl also says, ever more people today have the means to live, but no meaning to live for. We have the means to live, but no meaning to live for. It's our job to help restore people's purpose and their value. To have for purpose, we have to first know we have value. We are not complete until we experience love and can love others back. We have to remember we are operating in a culture, in an environment where the truth is written into people's hearts. We do have consciences. Human rights are written into our hearts. Deep down, many of us know this. We feel our human experiences, when we're given the tools to interpret them, our human experiences, very different. But when we're given the tools to interpret them, these different human experiences tell us the same things about the value of life, about sex, about our shared purpose and value. It's written into our hearts the truth that we are unrepeatable, that we are irreplaceable, that life is precious in and of itself, that life is worth living, and that we are actually made in the image of God, in his image and likeness, that we were made for love. Joseph Pieper, the German philosopher, says, love is the exclamation that it's good that you exist. It's good that you are in the world. And Thomas Aquinas says, fleshes it out further, Love is to will the good of the other. Love is to will the good of the other. These two affirmations, it is good that you exist, and I will the good for you, is what our culture so desperately needs to hear. We want to say, we have to say to the other, I want your good with a profound respect and a tenderness and affirmation of their existence. To will the other's good is to draw greatness out of the other. Love often means also telling the truth. Love without the truth isn't love. It becomes destructive. I want to talk for a moment about the faith. I know the topic of our conference, and I know that many of us here are people of faith, whether Protestant or Catholic. For our faith holds both that love and that truth. And our faith, our Catholic faith, informs truth in this world and is also informed by the realities found in science, in biology, in human reason, and the human experience. These two things in no way conflict. Some today, some people, especially in the public forum, in the the political debates, like to claim that the pro-life position is a religious one, and therefore it cannot hold in secular life. But we know what science, reason, and the human experience tells us about life, and we know that it's not only a religious belief. That said, the dichotomy between the religious and the non-religious as different spheres of life is a false one. To say that there are these two different spheres of life is a false distinction. Our faith is not in contradiction with the truth in any way. Whether you reference the words of Christ explicitly or the facts of biology, or ethical or moral arguments, all of it is the truth. We have to deepen our understanding of our faith, of science, of reason, none of which are in contradiction, all of which inform each other. There's a rich repository of wisdom in Catholic teaching, Catholic social teaching especially, and it's something that I became a Catholic over eight years ago, and I'm still learning, I'm still discovering but it has so much to teach us, just like the rest of the world of science and reason and philosophy has so much to teach us about the human condition, about what we are made for, about what wounds us, and about how to overcome those wounds. 
The division is not between the religious and the non-religious, or science and religion, or philosophy and religion. The division is between the truth and the lie. That is what should concern us. We also must not fall into the trap of thinking that sharing the truth today will be easy. And many of you, I know, already know this. We cannot be good Christians if we never challenge the people around us. There's a spirit of the world, a very real spirit, and then there is the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. That's why Christ gave us the Holy Spirit. Jesus warned us that we would be hated. He also said that no servant is greater than their master. He said that persecutions would come, but to not be afraid. And then St. Paul, one of his first apostles and the great evangelist, said that we are to become all things, that he is trying to become, and he urges us to become all things to all people. That means to meet people where they're at, to prepare to reach them, to understand them, to find the common ground, the common experience. We may not share the fullness of the truth in one conversation or one encounter. Often we won't. But we are there to share a little, to sow a seed. The Holy Spirit is promised to help us to be loving, to give us the wisdom that we need for these encounters. Whether they're encounters on social media, in our classrooms, whether they're encounters giving a talk, whether they're encounters in friendships, no matter where we are, he's promised to never leave us. The spirit in which we speak is paramount. And the great spiritual masterpiece by Henry Nouwen, he tells us the story again, that parable of the prodigal son. And I think many of us, as Nouwen comments throughout his book, and I highly recommend it, it's a masterpiece, many of us identify or maybe can identify with the prodigal son, with the one who is given a gift and then squanders it, the one who has betrayed maybe a loved one, maybe our father, our mother, who has betrayed a friend, and we go off and we squander. We go off and we sin. We go off and we do what we is not good for the other. It is not loving. And the, par- and the prodigal son takes the father's inheritance and effectively says, takes his inheritance, you are dead to me, father, and goes off and squanders it. And of course, comes back repentant and asks to be invited back in to the fold. Meanwhile, the older brother we might also identify with in the parable. The older brother is, of course, watching this happen. He's watching the prodigal son take the money, run off, waste it all in depravity, come back and want to be welcomed back, want to come back. And the older son, sometimes maybe we feel like that. We're trying to be good. We're trying to do what is right. We're trying to follow the rules. And we're not getting the blessings we think we deserve. We're not getting the answer to our prayer. Or maybe we're upset or jealous of the prodigal, that they're having so much fun, and then they get to come back and be welcomed back into the fold. They get to win their father's heart back so easily. And yet, as Nowen reveals throughout his book, we're not called to be the prodigal son or the older brother. We are called to be the father. We are called to be the one that welcomes back. We are called to be the one that forgives. We are called to be the one that opens our heart, the one that is generous, the one that is long-suffering. We are called to be the Father. We are called to take responsibility for each other. The Christian life is imitating Christ, and Christ's example to us is up on a cross. The Christian life is the one where we are meant to offer the mercy. We are meant to, as we've been forgiven, be the ones to forgive. But we can't do that. We can't have that tenderness until we've experienced the love of the Father. We can't do it on our own. We have to accept his mercy before we can give it to others. It was losing his own daughter, the story of Dr. Levitino. It was losing his own daughter that tenderized the heart of Dr. Levitino to suddenly see past the lies, see the lives of the children that he was taking. Our culture is hurting. We have to extend our hands, and we have to be the first to forgive and ask for forgiveness. We've been facing the crisis of abortion now for 45 years, and yet there is hope. We know this. We know that people do change, just like we each try to change every day, and we know that history does change. I want to close with a story about someone who's at the very heart of this weekend's solemn commemoration as we remember 45 years of Roe v. Wade and the lives lost and the people wounded. 
Norma McCorvey died last year. Norma is the Roe in Roe v. Wade, as many of you know. But Norma never had an abortion, although she would later work at an abortion facility. When Norma was 21, a Texas lawyer and an ambitious abortion advocate named Sarah Weddington found Norma facing an unplanned pregnancy. Sarah was looking for a plaintiff. Sarah made Norma her plaintiff in the case to challenge Texas's abortion law, and she would ultimately take that case to the Supreme Court. But Sarah hardly stayed in touch with Norma, and Norma would not make a single court appearance. After all, Norma was poor, they would say not very well spoken, uneducated, and she actually ended up carrying her child to term and placing her child for adoption. She never had an abortion. So Norma was not exactly the poster child that the abortion movement wanted, although they used her name. Norma would later come to lament her involvement in that infamous case. She ultimately converted to Christianity, became a pro-life activist, and then entered the Roman Catholic Church. But how many of us know, how many of you know, how Norma went from working at an abortion facility, which she would later do after Roe legalized abortion, how she went from working at an abortion facility to becoming a pro-life Catholic and even a Roman Catholic, a pro-life activist and even a Roman Catholic. Next door to the abortion facility where Norma worked, a pro-life group ended up leasing space. And every day, those that worked at this pro-life activist group would call out to Norma because they knew she worked there, and they would tell her that they were praying for her and they would encourage her to quit. And she would ignore them and be frustrated and go outside to smoke and go back into the facility and hate the things that they would yell, even though they were saying it in, in a kind way. It wasn't until she met the little daughter of one of the pro-life workers that Norma's heart began to melt. Four-year-old Emily would sometimes accompany her mother to work at the office. And Emily would run up to Norma in the parking lot and hug her, asking Norma how her day was. Emily's big hugs and kind words touched Norma in a way that no one else ever had. The turning point in the story of Norma's conversion was not the head of a pro-life group or those that would eventually lead her into the Roman Catholic Church. It was a little girl named Emily, a little girl who hugged her. What was that hug? What did it do for Norma? That hug awoke her tenderness. It brought out her spiritual motherhood. It's what Norma had been running from her whole life. While still alive, Jane Rowe, Norma McCorvey said, you read about me in the history books, but now I am dedicated to spending, to spreading the truth about preserving the dignity of all human life. Let's honor Norma's legacy and her conversion by committing together to fight for a world where everyone has the opportunity to convert, to fight for a world where every child is loved and protected and where every person, no matter how far they've fallen or how hurt they are, is given the chance to know the truth and to heal. I firmly believe that if we speak this truth with love, if we speak it tenderly, if we open our hearts and welcome the lives of the other, if we do not tire, tire in this love, we can transform this nation and our world and restore a shared reverence for the human person, especially the weakest, in our laws and in our hearts. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we have time for a quick uh, question and answer session. Um, we're going to have that mic set up in the front. A um, couple of things. Um, we want each, in the interest of time, we want you to ask one question. Um, 
and be concise. Also, it's question and answer, so please phrase your comments in the form of a question. Um, and you can, get, you can start lining up in the center stage here. We'll give you a couple minutes to start lining up. And you all might know, but we are live action online, so please follow us. Is anyone following live action? Facebook, Insta, Twitter. Okay, good, we've got a few. Definitely follow us. We're constantly trying to create the content that helps reach people and touch people. The videos, the articles, the stories, connecting people to the heart of our, our fight for life and telling the stories that transform hearts and minds and really, really tenderize, we hope, tenderize hearts. Yes, go ahead. Hello, I'm Matthew from Mount St. Mary's, and I'm wondering, how would you convince somebody who's not religious to see intrinsic value in human life? Mm, it's a good question. Michael says, how do we convince the people to see the intrinsic value? Well, I think first is find a common ground. If we're not arguing about the humanity of the child, maybe they agree, yeah, it's a baby, it's a human life, just like you and I are human, and it's just a matter of time. You've kind of established that, that principle. It's just a question of the value you would maybe be good, would be good to question, to really understand what do they think about the value of human life? Do they think human life holds any value? Is human life just as valuable as any other animal species, as plants? Where is the line for them? Is there a line? And I think asking questions instead of maybe just saying, this is what I think, of course, engaging them to really find out how do they come to that understanding? Why do, why do they think that? You'll, you might discover that there was actually a really hard experience in their life that made them see life as very existential and maybe, in a way, meaningless. And that's actually the thing that you need to talk about. Because at its logical level, we know that there's an order to our universe. We know that we are very different than our, our other mammals out there. We know that we have capacities they don't have. So you can make a logical case, but often you're going to find, if you're engaging one-on-one, -on -one, that there's something deeper than a question of logic going on. It's a question of the heart and something that that person maybe hasn't connected yet about their own value. Thank you. Hi, um, my question is about voting for life um, because it's really difficult to see those politicians who um, like actually are pro-life and aren't just saying it for the vote or um, like getting lobby money and um, like come November I might vote for a politician and then they end up not being pro-life. And so I was just wondering if you had any advice for like deciphering that, if that makes That's sense. That's a great question. So it is a very good question, the fact that in politics, and we just had a, a big election recently where it was like, is this guy, who is, are they pro-life or not? You know, they, there's a lot of statements that seem to confuse people and there's the history of the candidate. So I think you have to look at their, their record of actions as best you can and not what they say, because words are cheap and actions matter the most in the political world. You have to see how they would legislate. If you don't have much of a track record to go off, one thing to look at is who are they surrounding themselves with? Who's on their campaign? Who would be their appointees? Who's their running mate if it's a presidential election? And does that person have a track record? And then, of course, in politics, we're not, we don't have to always, it, it's not a binary choice. If there's two people on the ballot and both are unacceptable to vote for, you might not be able to vote for either because maybe both are in support of abortion. So we have to make that decision prudentially and we're not required to have to vote for someone, especially if it's gonna violate our conscience and what we know to be right. So I think looking at their background, looking at what they do and not what they say, and then once they're in office, <laughs> our job, and please get involved if you're not already with Live Action or other, other group to do lobbying calls, we just have to slam them and be like, you gotta do the right thing now and encourage them to take, take the stand they promised to take. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm a senior from the University of Dayton. And my question is, um, I guess first off, you mentioned that um, there's this discrepancy between pro-life and pro-choice people about basically framing the issue as a religious issue versus a political issue. And I would ask, why do you think uh, it's better to frame it as a moral or religious issue over a political issue? And if so, um, what's the best way to go about doing that? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think most profoundly it's a human issue and a human rights issue that obviously also is a religious, a political, all these other issues because it, it's such an, it, it, affects, it affects the very core of what it means to be human. So I think the best place to start, I, I find, in conversation is not with the politics or the religion unless that's the person's like, passion and they want to really discuss that specifically, but to start with human rights. 
And do you believe that we have rights? We have to have shared human rights in order to have a just society and, and a working society. And the vast majority of people are going to say, absolutely. And then you have to evaluate, OK, well, you have to discuss, well, what's, what's the first right? Is there a first human right? And I think we can all agree it's life. You can't enjoy other rights without it. And then you go to, OK, well, does life extend to all humans, or do some humans not have that right? And where do you draw the line? And if they say, well, I draw it at birth, or I draw it at the first trimester, why do you draw it there? What makes the embryo at this stage less valuable than the embryo at that stage? And maybe they'll say it's their ability to, re their ability to be developed in a certain way. Maybe their, um, you know, their neur neurology is developed enough, or you know, they might have an arbitrary line of development. And then you can go into, well, why does that define humanity? Is someone who maybe doesn't have that capacity as an adult or as a born child because they have intellectual disabilities or they have other challenges, are they then less human? So you can engage them. And there's some phenomenal. Um, apologetics books that Live Action promotes on our website. We actually can get you a free copy sent if you want, if you send us an email. But one of my favorites is by a dear friend of mine called Love Unleashes Life by Stephanie Gray. You may have heard of her, her book, but start to kind of think through how to ask the right questions, and it's amazing to see how transformative those conversations can be. Thank you. Okay, time for one more question. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Betsy from St. Louis University. Um, my question is, um, so your uh, speech was awesome, and I loved your um, everything you said about um, just like faith and how that can really move people. It was a very touching story, and I'm interested um, because I have like uh, kind of followed live action for a little bit and um, noticed that live action tends. And maybe I've missed this, but like it seems to tend to be largely non-religious. Um, and I'm just interested, like what your reasoning for that um, and what role like religion does or doesn't play in live action. Um, Absolutely, that. that's a great question. So live action are job is to educate on abortion. And that is, of course, part of the Catholic faith. It's part of the Christian faith that human life is inviolable, cannot be violated. So in that sense, it is religious, but it's also not religious in the sense that someone who's not religious might not hold that belief, might not also be religious. So they might be pro-life and they haven't entered into the fullness of, you know, Christ is God, I'm a Christian, but they're starting at the starting point of a human life is precious, and I want to defend human rights. So I, I don't like to say live action is non-religious or it is religious. It just is telling the truth about abortion. And I'm obviously a Catholic, <laughs> and that's a part of, you know, when I talk and when I share. But the educational materials we create at live action are designed to educate about the science, about the reason, and about the shared human experience around abortion. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. God bless. <laughs>